Father, we do, we just bow our hearts low before you, and we're just so grateful for gracing us with your presence this morning, and Lord, just for the heaviness of, of who you are, and Lord, we do just stand in awe of you, and Lord, even in light of what Larry said about the light, Lord, that the light overpowers the darkness. Lord God, the, the darkness cannot yeah. overpower yeah. the light, Amen. but we thank Amen. you that it's your light that can overcome the darkness. And Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in this hour, Lord, even though it's not the way we thought, we know that your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And Lord, we just ask even today that you come to us and that you unveil your son to us through the proclamation of the word. We don't want to just get knowledge and information, but we want there to be a real impartation of spirit and life, Lord. We just cry out that you that you just take Ken aside and that you, you, Jesus, will come in and through him and that you will speak, not by power nor by might, but by the spirit of the Lord. And Lord, we pray that you would even bypass things that he thought he was going to say, and you will put exactly what you want to speak to, to us this and this hour, Lord. If ever there's a time that we needed to know covenant, and it needs to become bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, it is now. Now is the time we need to grab hold of the covenant that you have cut for us, and we need to learn how to walk in that in light of that. And Lord, we just thank you for that, and we do just cry out that you glorify your son through this. We pray and we thank you that you have made a new and a living way. Lord, it's not the old, but it's a new way that you have made. And Lord, just even through the worship that you were just bringing to light, even the fact that your blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Lord, because it's, it's the eternal God. It's you, the eternal God, who came and willingly it willingly bore our sin and bled in our behalf that we might have life. But it's, it will speak forever, forever and ever. And we thank you that your covenant speaks a better word. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And one thing I, he once wanted me to share that really, I, sometimes it takes me a while to get the revelation. I know he was preaching last Sunday and talking about the importance of learning to live by covenant. And if we've ever, ever needed to know, know it. And I really saw that today like I've never seen it before because there's going to be a time that we, and just even in light of just certain things, people go into the doctors and not getting the help that they need and just in different situations, our real answer is him and grabbing hold of our covenant partner. And, and that's just... Is yeah. That, was that what yeah. I was supposed to <laughs> <laughs> You did good, darling. Yeah, I meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wanted to share that. Because I think it really is a, a word of the Lord that we're living in an hour where um, that's what the Lord's been putting on my heart for now, a year now, is that we're living in the hour in which we really have to learn to live by covenant. It's really, really uh, important that we, that we do that. So uh, I think it's a timely series, and we'll do, like I said, uh, last week we'll do a, a series on health and healing and then another one on provision and another one on protection over, sometime during the year, just some mini series uh, on, on those things. And so this is part two of the, of the message about covenant, about walking by covenant or living by covenant. And I really want to just uh, emphasize, it goes along with what Donna was saying, and uh, is that it's really important that we don't just treat this uh, con this topic, not necessarily the message itself, but the topic of living by covenant as just okay teaching and don't and not do anything with it because it's so easy to do that. You know, with any uh, any message, no matter who preaches it, it's so easy to uh, just to listen to it, maybe be encouraged by it or whatever, but not to actually incorporate it into our lives. Um, 
but this is important that we learn. I, I really believe this in this season and what we're entering into, uh, both the glory and uh, the light that Larry was prophesying about, but also the darkness that's coming, you know, as, the, as we move further and further into this decade. And we must learn to live by covenant. I really feel very, very strongly uh, about that, that we have to learn to live by covenant. So I'm hoping that what you'll do is that you won't just take this as a teaching, but that you'll really meditate upon these ideas and begin to live uh, in the power of covenant. There really is a, a lot of power uh, in the covenant promises that God uh, has given to us. So can we agree that we want to try to do that? Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this message is, is entitled Heirs to the Blessings of Abraham. Heirs to the Blessings of Abraham. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to just do a, start out with a little bit of uh, review. I want to review a little bit from last week and then talk just a little bit about some of the steps of ancient covenant making. And then we'll get into Galatians chapter 3 where we talk about uh, the blessings of Abraham. Uh, just in terms of review, I have like uh, six points, but I'm going to go through them really quickly from last week. Uh, important that we hear that. And if you weren't, didn't get the message last week, uh, uh, I was a little bit delinquent getting the, the, some of the stuff I had to do up. So hopefully it'll be posted uh, soon if it's not already uh, on the website where you can go to it and listen uh, to it. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about some of the steps we talked about last week, some of the points that I made from last week. First one is that New Testament believers are in a covenant relationship with God through Christ. Uh, now, this is really important. Uh, I talked about this a good bit last week, and I'm not going to repeat much about it. But, uh, you know, if you look at the Western church and some of the mentality in the Western church, it's almost like you've got a choice. You can believe in Jesus or you can really live for Jesus. And either one's kind of okay. Living for him results in, uh, you know, greater role in eternity, but just believing in him uh, will lead you to uh, at least get into heaven. Well, there's, no, there's not a two-tiered set of belief in the scripture. You enter into the new covenant in Christ, which comes through belief. Uh, and if it's true belief, you will actually enter the covenant. But a lot of the Western church is just, it says, I will just believe a set of facts about him, that he was a real person, that he was fully God and fully man, and they died on the cross. Uh, but the New Testament speaks of entering into a covenant relationship, the new covenant. And so as we walk with God, we've entered into a new covenant relationship uh, with Christ. Covenant also, I talked last week about covenant binds us to Christ and it binds Christ to us. It's a, it's a drawing together. That's what the word covenant uh, really means. It's a, it's a formal, solemn, binding agreement uh, based upon a common purpose uh, secured by blood sacrifice which binds two parties together for, uh, as one for life. And we talked about that, that when we enter into the new covenant in the, in the spirit, we're immediately one with Christ in the spirit. Now we spend the lifetime drawing into unity, becoming more and more unified with him in soul and in body. But covenant binds us to him and it, bind, it, it gives us uh, kind of a, a, an anchor. We talked about this last week, an anchor that we, can, uh, in the, that we can hold fast to uh, where, when we have times of need. We can hold on to that uh, rope that's attached to the anchor so that we don't drift, so that we don't fall, so we don't sink. Uh, and so this a covenant, it's a binding agreement, very serious agreement in the scriptures. The, the third point is the new covenant is different than any of the Old Testament covenants. The, 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 new, te the new covenant is different. The new covenant is internal, whereas the Old Testament covenants were external. They were external. Uh, you, the, but the new covenant is an internal covenant. You know, uh, Jeremiah talked about that, Ezekiel. Uh, the, you know, the book of Hebrews talks about that as well. And so Christ comes in us. And we talk about these steps of covenant making. Let's remind ourselves that they're happening in our heart. The, co the new covenant comes into our heart. 
uh, and it transforms. That's why when Jesus gave the terms of the, of the covenant, he was saying, you know, you've heard in the law that you should not be angry or that you should not commit adultery. You've heard those things. I say uh, that you shall not have anger in your heart, that you shall not have lust in your heart. In other words, what does he do? He takes it from an external thing into an internal thing. He raises the bar, but at the same time, God lives within us uh, to overcome and to execute uh, the obedience and the, and the things that we need to do as we cooperate with him. So it's a very important distinction. You know, Hebrews talks about it, um, it's a better covenant based on better promises. That's part of the reason it's a better covenant. It's internal. It's in our heart. And God himself is the one that, that uh, executes uh, the covenant within us. And that leads us to the next thing that we talked about, that the new covenant was cut between the Father and the Son. The new covenant was cut between the Father and the Son, not between God and us. The, you know, we talked about this last week. One of the steps of covenant making is that they, they selected a covenant representative. Each, if two people were going or two parties were going to enter into a covenant, each party would select a representative. Let's say this half of the room was going to enter into a covenant with that half of the room. This half of the room would select a representative. This half of the room would select a representative. They would actually execute the covenant on behalf of all the people. And so if Brian, for example, was the representative for this part of the room, he would make the declarations, he would make the agreements on behalf of the whole group, and then the whole group would enter in based on Brian's uh, uh, entering into the covenant agreement. They would enter into the covenant in Brian. Now, that's what happens with the new covenant. Jesus, when he came to earth, became the covenant representative of the Father. Uh, he was also the covenant representative of us. He was the covenant. So the so he was the covenant representative of both mankind and of God. That's why he's the mediator. He's the, he's the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, and so when we enter into the covenant, we enter into it in Christ. We enter into the new covenant in Christ based on what he has done, based on his work, based on his death on the cross and his ultimate resurrection. So we enter into the covenant in him. Now that makes a, a, a huge distinction between the new covenant and old covenants. And we'll talk about, uh, and when we get to Galatians, we'll talk about a little bit of that. It kind of goes along uh, with what Brian was talking about when he was declaring over us earlier in the, in the service about who God is and how his heart for us and all that. All that's possible because the new covenant was cut between the Father and the Son. Uh, very important uh, distinction there. Uh, the next point, God is loyal and faithful to his covenant. We looked at that word kesed, which is loving kindness. It's a Hebrew word that's translated throughout the Old Testament as loving kindness. Uh, it doesn't mean God love, God's kind and he loves us, uh, which you would think, loving kindness, even though he, he does love us and he is kind. But that's not the meaning of that word. It's a word that's, that is focused uh, total, essentially totally on those who walk by covenant, on his covenant people. It's a legal binding. It has a connotation of a legal intent. God's legally saying that I'm going to devote myself to those who walk in covenant. Uh, it has the idea of love. It has the idea of strength. But it basically is a sense of God's devotion to us. His loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness is everlasting. His devotion to his covenant promises is everlasting. And you can just look at the scriptures there. Just look, a, uh, you just look up that word, loving kindness, and see how God uses it through the scripture. But it's a word uh, totally focused on God's covenant promises to us, on his covenant relationship with us. He is loyal to his covenant. He's a covenant making, but he's also a covenant keeping God. And we're going to need more and more to learn to live by covenant. 
Uh, and the last point of review of uh, some of the points I made uh, last week is that our covenant relationship with Christ is meant to be an anchor to our soul. It's meant to be an anchor to our soul. It, in other words, we're supposed to be able to enter into it, obviously, and live by it, but we're supposed to be able to hold fast to it, to hold on uh, to, uh, to our covenant relation, our covenant partner, the Lord, and the promises that he makes through covenant. That we have, in other words, he makes these promises through covenant, but he wants us to hold on to them. They become an anchor of the soul. You know, we talked about this from Hebrews chapter 6, uh, and where it talks about God is an anchor for our soul. But if you remember, the one word was interposed by an oath. That's a covenant word. That's a covenant word. It has the connotation of cutting a covenant. One of the meanings of the Greek word there is, relation, is related to covenant. So because God has cut a covenant with us, he, his, that relationship, that covenant relationship becomes an anchor that we can hold on to to keep us drifting uh, from, and from, uh, away from him and also uh, to keep us, uh, to, be give, to give us an opportunity to, to hang on to him with the promises uh, that he says. So anyway, that's, the, um, that's some of the review from last week. I want to just talk a little bit about some of the steps. Um, you know, I, I get, I, I'm not going to try to go through all these steps, but uh, there were eight common steps in, in ancient covenant making. And uh, I shared this last week. I, I wrote a book about uh, understanding your inheritance in Christ, which goes a lot into covenant. Uh, and if you would like a copy of that, uh, there's some more out there on the uh, kitchen uh, counter out there. You're free. You can take one free. Just, uh, just go ahead and get it on the way out if you want to look at more into these eight steps. It goes into all these eight steps in a in a lot of detail. But when Jesus came to earth, he went through, he essentially initiated these eight steps of covenant making. In other words, I'll just cut, touch on a couple of them. The pre-ceremony actions. When, God, when, when Christ came to earth, the pre-ceremony actions were determining the terms and the conditions of a covenant. Before a covenant was determined or cut, they had, they listed the terms. Okay, this is the, this is what we're doing with this covenant. You see that with Abrahamic covenant. In, in Genesis chapter 12, God said to him, if you'll leave your homeland and if you'll do these things, I'll bless you and I'll do all these things. That was the pre-ceremony uh, call to Abraham. The actual covenant wasn't cut to Genesis chapter 15, where you see uh, that where they walk between uh, the flesh, um, the pieces of flesh. And so that's what Jesus did. When he, his three and a half years of ministry, you know, with the Sermon on the Mount and all of the different things that he did and he taught, he said, okay, this is the conditions of entering into the new covenant. Uh, you know, it's not just I can say, you know, just confess him as, as Lord and Savior and live any way I want to. When you're entering in the new covenant, you're committing to, to live by these things that Jesus taught uh, in the new covenant. And so each one of these steps uh, has meaning. Uh, you know, I'll talk about a little bit about the walk unto death. You know, when two parties were entering into a covenant, uh, that, again, the two representatives, well, they would stand between pieces of a, a sacrificial animal, a sacrifice of some sort, and they would make, they would take a walk between those pieces of flesh and they would say, if I don't live by these terms that, that we've agreed to, the pre-ceremony terms, if I don't live by these things, let it be done to me just like it is to this piece of flesh. In other words, let, it, let me die if I don't live by what I promise uh, to do. Uh, and so that's what we're entering into. You know, Jesus did die for us. He became the sacrifice and he took the walk unto death to the cross. But he says to us, okay, if you're going to enter into this covenant, you've got to die. Die to self. You know, who, everyone who wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, daily, and follow me. 
Uh, and so as we enter into this covenant, we're, we're taking that uh, one time, but then daily that walk into death to die to self and then let God uh, take control of our lives. So then the, the other step, which we're going to talk about today, is the pronouncements of blessings and curses. As they, after they took the walk into death, they were saying, okay, I'm going to, each party would say, I'll bless you with this and that, and I'll bless you with all these things that have been predetermined. But if you, do, if you disobey, I'll curse you with these kind of curses. And so we'll, we'll look more in that uh, in a minute. Uh, there was also the exchange of names and the seal of a covenant uh, mark. I want to talk just a second about the covenant mark. I, I, I was trying to decide whether to do this or not, but I really just feel like uh, the Lord is, is saying this because it's so important. Um, you know, the, and when, as we were getting ready today, um, I, as we were leaving and on the way to church, uh, I realized I didn't, for some reason, I didn't put my wedding ring on uh, today. And I, I, I never forget putting on my wedding ring. Um, and it, it was interesting. You know, whenever I do a, a marriage ceremony and when I do the rings, my little speech related before I say, with this ring I thee wed, uh, repeat after me. And before I say that, I say, you know, the co- the, the wedding ring is a symbol of covenant. You know, when people would enter into a covenant relationship, they would, uh, they would often exchange some sort of a gift or a token as a sign of their marriage that they're entering into. And I said, this is what the ring is, and with this ring, uh, they wed. And so when I forgot it, and, I, and I've kind of, it's, it's kind of been weird. I feel kind of like I'm not completely dressed or something. Uh, without it on, you know. Um, and this is what, but here's what the Lord's, want, the, the point the Lord wants to make. Um, the new covenant, there's a sign. Uh, you know, in one sense, the sign that we've entered into, the internal sign that we've entered into a new covenant is that we have a circumcised heart. You know, the sign that people entered into the Abrahamic covenant was they got, the men got circumcised. Paul talks about we have a circumcised heart. That's the sign, internal sign, that we uh, have been, have we've actually been born again, have entered into a covenant. It's not walking down the aisle. It's not saying a prayer. Uh, the sign is internally, is my heart been circumcised? Is it my heart been changed? Is it, is God cutting, beginning to cut away of the flesh out of my heart? Uh, but there was also, there's also an external sign, an external sign that I'm living by covenant. You know, part of it, the first one would be baptism, water baptism. Uh, you know, and then there are others, the various baptism would be a, a part of that. But this really hit me oh, uh, just a few days ago. I'm reading a book right now. Uh, it's, it's, so far, it's been a great book, and it's talking about uh, the covenant that was cut uh, at Mount Sinai with, with Israel. Uh, and they talked about all the different aspects of it. But, it. but the author was talking about it, and he was saying that there's a sign that goes along with that covenant. And he said the external sign of the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant was honoring the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath. And I never heard of it, never thought about it in that, in that terms, uh, they, to honor the Sabbath. And I feel like what the Lord wants us to do, he says, we, you know, obviously there's, I don't want to go into all the details about what this, the New Testament fulfillment of the Sabbath is, but the Sabbath, they set apart that day unto God. And I feel like we're entering into a time, and it's really important. So hear my heart. It's not a rebuke. It's not a, uh, a word of criticism, but it's, a, but it's a plea really with us. We must honor the assembly. It's a, sign, it's a sign to us. It's a sign to the world. Uh, it's important in the days ahead. We must honor the gathering of the assembly. Now, that's one reason I believe 
that God says, do not forsake the assembly. You know, it was interesting, if you look at Isaiah, I'm not going to turn there, but if you look at to Isaiah chapter 56, where he t- a couple times he says, hold fast to the covenant. And then a lot of what Isaiah talks about in that chapter is if you honor the Sabbath, if you don't profane the Sabbath, if you hold fast, if you don't do that, hold fast to the covenant. It's a sign to the world that I'm in covenant with God. Gathering together. You know, we've, I think the pendulum, which often happens, you know, we, when we were, I mean, we were part evangelical, most of us. And, you know, it's like church attendance was almost the way to salvation. Uh, and God, and we kind of shifted away from that, saying that's not true. It's our personal walk with God. And it is. It is our personal walk with God. But I think the Lord wants to emphasize, reemphasize to us here locally, gathering with the body is important. Gathering with the body is extremely important. It's a sign to the world that I'm living for God. But also, this is maybe not directly related to covenant, but there's things that happen when we gather together in the body that do not happen uh, normally when we are alone. God does things when we're the gathering together uh, in the body. I mean, just like Brian was talking about the, the anointing upon the worship this morning. Uh, I'm not sure you could have felt that to that degree if you weren't here gathering together. So anyway, enough said about that. That's a, little, that's a bonus uh, thing for us, but it's important that we gather together, you know. I know this is winter break, but, you know, I know in a month it would be spring break. And then there'll be summer break. And then there'll be fall break. And then there'll be Thanksgiving break. And then there'll be Christmas break. Uh, You know, there are a lot of breaks in American culture now. And God wants us to join. He wants us to be together. Uh, It's really important. This is important. Yes, we need time to take a vacation and do this or do that. I'm not saying we don't need those things. And I know I'm speaking to the ones that are here right now, uh, but hopefully the others will, will all get the message. Hopefully we'll all get the message. It's important that we gather uh, together. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Okay. You still love me for that? Okay. Yeah. It wasn't very enthusiastic, but I, I'll, I'll take it. All right. Okay. Let's now. Let's. I want to go now. I want to go now into uh, talking about the the blessings of Abraham. Uh, it's basically, basically it's Galatians chapter three. Uh, and I want, I want, I, I would like to read the whole chapter, but I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to read, um, several points there. What was happening just to give you a little bit of background and we, you know, we, in our home groups, we studied Galatians. It was really a powerful time when we studied it. But part of the, the reason Paul wrote Galatians was it was that Judaizers were coming uh, to try to lead the Galatian church astray. They were saying that it's not enough just to have faith. You have to also keep the law. And so Paul was confronting that in the book of Galatians. He was confronting that. And Galatians chapter 3 is a, a major part of that confrontation. You know, And he starts out with, Who's bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified, you know, by trying to get you to, uh, to, to add to faith uh, the keeping of the law. And so, you know, he says things in verse 2, you know, how did you come to Christ? Uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Hearing with faith. And that's an important part in terms of our walk with God. We hear, we enter, we get the Spirit and we relate to the Holy Spirit by hearing with faith. Uh, And then verse 5, he says, uh, so then does he who provides you with the Spirit, and here's a key phrase here, and works miracles among you, 
So he's talking about miracles here. Miracles among you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And so here, miracles, he says, okay, miracles is part of the walk here. It's part of the covenant, but we get it by hearing with faith. And let's go on. And then, um, and then in verse 6, let me just read this section here. So, Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Those who are, the, are, are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And so verse nine, so then those who are of faith are, are blessed with Abraham, the believer. And so what, what is he doing here? He is incorporating uh, the Gentiles into the blessings of Abraham. Uh, he is saying, yeah, Abraham, he's making a couple of points here. One, he's making a point that Abraham believed and he was declared righteous. So you, Abraham didn't have to keep the law in order to be uh, righteous. In fact, the law wasn't even uh, developed at that point uh, in time. It wasn't given until later to the time of Moses and was the law given. So he was, he was declared righteous by faith. But he's also saying that Gentiles are incorporated into this Abrahamic covenant by this. Okay, I'm, I'm leading to something here. That the Gentiles are, are into that, are, are incorporated or grafted in to the co covenant that God made with Abraham. And as, as he says later in here, Gentiles, we believers in Christ, are heirs to the promises of Abraham. Uh, so let's keep on going here. Um, Let's just go down to, uh, there's a lot in all of this, but just to save time, uh, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now that's a, hangs on a tree, that's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22. Uh, in order that Christ, Je in Christ Jesus, remember, New covenant, we're in Christ. The blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Uh, now, that's an important point as, as well. But you can see what he did. What does he do here? He says, okay, Gentiles are part of the Abrahamic covenant. He says that we are heirs to the blessings of Abraham, but we're not subject to the curses of the law. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit later in just a, in, a, in a few minutes. So we're blessed, but we're not cursed. We're heirs to the blessings promised to Abraham, but we're not subject to the curses because Jesus became the curse. When he died on the cross, when Christ died on the cross, remember it turned dark for three hours while he was on the cross, he took upon himself all sin, from the beginning, from Adam to the end of uh, the ages, he took all sin, he took all sickness, he took all demonic oppression, defilement, perversion, uh, you know, all of, the, of the, the depths of depravity of man, he took it upon himself. And with that, he took the curse. That's, you know, in other words, it says in, in the Gospels, that Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't eliminate the law, he fulfilled it. And he, so therefore he took the curse. And so in the new covenant, another reason why the new covenant is better, as a better covenant based on better promises, is that we're heirs to the promises of God, but we're not subject to the curses of the law, which we'll talk about in a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and, and all that talks about the blessings and the curses of God. That's a very important uh, point uh, for us. Um, there, now he goes on in verse 15. He talks about, let's, let's go to just verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, not to seeds, but to Abraham 
uh, to his seeds. But it does not, verse 17, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified God by God to nullify the promise. For the inheritance, if the inheritance is based on law, uh, it, it would no longer be a promise. So the promises are to Christ, but remember, in the new covenant, it was cut between the Father and the Son, so we are in Christ. The seed, Christ, is the heir of the promise, but we are in him. And so we're heirs to the promises that were made uh, to Christ uh, as well. Let's see what else here. Now, verse 24 is a, is a key verse here. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. So we're all sons of God through Christ. For all of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And in verse 29, I'll read that one. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So what is he saying here? If we belong to Christ, because the promises was made to Christ is the seed, then you are Abraham's descendants or Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise. So it's clear he's saying you're heir according to the promise. Okay, now I hope it's not getting too tedious, but, I want, but it's important that we lay a foundation uh, for this. Um, there are basically two views on what this is all about. Uh, there's an evangelical view that would say that what Paul is talking about is strictly uh, about uh, righteousness being by faith. Uh, it has nothing to do with promises like uh, healing and uh, provision and protection and those kinds of things. And then there's the, the charismatic view, which focuses almost totally upon the fact that we're heirs to the, to the promises of Abraham, the blessings of Abraham, which deals with issues like healing and health and protection and prosperity and all of that. And that's where kind of a lot of the prosperity gospel uh, comes from. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say this. This is kind of my view about it. If you, if you do a Google, Google search on the blessings of Abraham, you'll, you'll come across both of those views. They're all over the Internet. Both views are. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that Paul's primary purpose of writing this was to demonstrate that righteousness comes by faith, not by works. That, that was the primary reason that he wrote this. He was confronting the, the people who would say there's faith, uh, but there's also works of law, of, of, of the law, keeping the law that makes you justified. And he was confronting that. That was his primary purpose of writing that. But in my, this is my view on it, and you can study your own view, but what I believe, you come up with your own view, but what I believe he was saying was that Yes, that's the primary point of this, but also as a byproduct of this, we're also heirs to these things that the charismatics uh, hang on to. I think both are true. Uh, yes, the pro probably, I mean, especially the older I get, the more what I th think is the more important of the two is the fact that we're righteous by the blood of Jesus. Because that's the only way we're going to go to heaven is through the, the, the righteousness of Christ and our entering our life being hidden or clothed with Christ who is the righteous one. But at the same time, I don't want to throw away the, the blessings that God says, I'll bring, I'll, I'm going to bring healing, I'll bring provision, I'll prosper you, I'll protect you uh, in all uh, of, these, uh, of these things. So let's look at the blessings of Abraham for a minute. Let's look first at the blessings uh, because we're righteous in Christ. We're justified in Christ. I, and Brian kind of stole my thunder with what he was sharing earlier. I didn't know he was going to share all that. Uh -huh. I didn't think about that. Yeah, no, I know he did. Yeah, I think. But that was like, okay, what he said, I agree. That's a, that is what 
because of the, our righteousness, we are justified by Christ. Now, justified means that we have been declared righteous. It's, been, it's a gift. Paul talks about this in Romans. It's a gift given to us at the moment we enter into salvation, our spirit becomes totally righteous and one with Christ. And therefore, we are loved even in our weaknesses. We don't have to get to the point where we're perfect and we're, that we're obedient in everything for God to love us. He loves us even the moment we're born again. I mean, he loves us even before that, but there's a covenant love that comes the moment we're born again. We don't have to work to earn his, his approval. We don't have to be obedient uh, to earn his love. Now, he wants us to be obedient. I'm not saying we're not, we're, we're not supposed to grow in maturity and grow in obedience. There's sanctification that comes with that. But we are accepted in the beloved. He, for, he, he remembers our sins and our lawless deeds no more, Hebrews chapter 10. He, re, he remembers those things no more. Those are important things. And that's the way we go to heaven is because of the blood of Christ and that our life is hidden with him. And therefore, that's how we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Uh, because, you know, in the old covenant, only the high priest could come before the, before the uh, holy of holies, a, a picture of the throne. Only the high priest could do that. And he could only do it once a year because the blood of the lambs didn't accomplish what the blood of Christ is. But because the blood of Christ has done all that, we can come boldly before the throne of Christ in our times of need and get help whenever we need it. And so there's that dimension of the, of the blessings of Abraham that, that come through justification and through righteousness. There's no condemnation in Christ you know, you can, all the things that Brian talked about, he did it a lot more eloquently than I'm saying it. But all those things are ours because we are justified and been declared righteous uh, by the blood of Christ as we enter into the new covenant. But now I want to talk about now, I want to talk about the blessings of Abraham uh, as it relates to uh, these Issues like healing and health and provision and protection. Uh, let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 7 to start with. Actually, let's go to Deuteronomy 28 uh, to, to kind of give you a general picture. If you look at Deuteronomy 28, remember Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Deuteronomy 28 talks about the blessings for obedience to the law and the curses for disobedience to the law. Uh, and this was part of the Old Covenant. This was part of the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant. You know, we'll, I'll, I'll come back to these in a minute. But, you know, he says in 28 verse 1, if you, Now it shall be, if you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments, which I commands you today. The Lord will set you above the, all the nations and all these blessings shall come upon you and shall overtake you if you will obey the Lord your God. So he's talking about blessings. And then in verse, starting with verse 15, he says, you know, but if you don't be obedient, these, all these curses shall come upon you. And he lists all kind of Curses, curses of sickness, curses of lack of protection, curses of uh, uh, poverty, and all sorts of things there. So there's blessings and there's curses. But in the new covenant, like we read in Galatians, we're heirs to the promises, but Jesus took these curses. So we're not heir to these curses. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is described in detail here in Deuteronomy 28 and in other places. And so he talks about, I just want to read, in fact, actually the whole book of Deuteronomy was, was pertaining to about a month of time as they were getting ready to enter into the, uh, to the land. And it talked about the blessings for obedience and the curses for disobedience. But let's just, I want to read from Deuteronomy chapter 7, talking about the blessings. 
uh, uh, th- 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 this one is related to healing. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God. He is the faithful God who keeps covenant and his loving kindness, in other words, his loyalty and faithfulness to his covenant, to a thousandth generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. But he repays those who hate him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him uh, to his face, talking about the curses. Uh, And then go to verse 15. This is, um, we'll start with 14. You shall be blessed above all the people. There shall be no male or female barren among you or among your cattle. In verse 15, and the Lord will remove from you all sickness. The Lord will remove from you all sickness and he will not put on you any of the harmful diseases of Egypt which you have known, he will lay them on all who will ha- who hate you. And the point is that he says, okay, I'm going to take away sicknesses. Now that's part, uh, consistent with his name, Jehovah Rapha, which he had uh, 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 released in, in the book of Exodus. If he declared that I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. I'll put none of the diseases of Egypt upon you. Remember in covenant, one of the things we didn't really talk much about is that we have, there's an exchange of names. You know, when we get married, the wife takes the name of her husband. It takes on the name. We can take on the name of our covenant partner, Christ. His name is Jehovah Rapha. His name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. His name is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. You know, his name is Jehovah Roy, the Lord our shepherd. His name is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner of victory. We have access to call and covenant with him on these names when we have need of him. And so he's saying here that one of the blessings of Abraham, blessings to Abraham, is I am the Lord your healer. And I'll put none of the diseases of Egypt upon you. Now let's look over at Deuteronomy 8, 18. Again, these are all blessings and curses uh, of, the ble- of the Abrahamic covenant as they're getting ready to enter the land. 8.18 But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is in this day. I, I love that verse of scripture. He gives you the power for a provision but so that he can establish his covenant uh, with you. Um, now, let's go back now to Deuteronomy 28. And these blessings shall overcome you, in verse 2, and will obey, if you'll obey the Lord your God. Blessed you shall be in the city, and blessed you shall be in the country. Blessed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground. Uh, Blessed and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of the herd and the young of your flock. Blessed shall you be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you and they shall come against you one way but they shall flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessings upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you if you will keep the commandments of the Lord uh, your God and walk in his ways. So all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity and the offspring of your body and the offspring of your beast and the produce of your ground in the land which the Lord gave, uh, swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will, God will open your, your storehouse in the heavens to rain uh, to the land in the season to bless you in all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Uh, and so anyway, it goes on. And then starting with 16, he talks about the curses uh, Let me just read one of these. Verse 27. The Lord will smite you with boils of Egypt and with tumors and with the scab and with the itch 
which you shall cannot be healed. Can I hear an amen on that? <laughs> the good news is, though, he's redeemed us from that. So we can, just, we can say, we can believe, I will not be smelt, smelt with boils or tumors or the itch or whatever because he has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Now, I want, us to, I want to challenge us to believe that God is our healer, that God is our provider, and that God is our protector. You, because the American church has been living based on the health care system of the American health care system. We've been living upon the protection of our government and our law enforcement agencies. Uh, we have been living by the provision of the American economy. Almost totally. And, God, and what I'm sensing is in the days ahead, in the days of coming, those support systems provided by the economy, the healthcare system, and the government at best are going to be taken away. They may be coming against us where they've been an area of support in the future. And we're going to have to learn to live by covenant. We're going to have to learn to live based on the health care system called Jehovah Rapha. We're going to have to learn to live by the protection of the Lord our God. We're going to have to get our provision from the Lord. So I believe living by the new covenant and the promises of the blessings of Abraham are going to be increasingly an important concept that way. Just share one example. I don't remember exactly the year, but uh, Donna and I and Ben and Judy Foster, who were with us for a long time, and now they've moved to Alabama years ago. We were in, in India, and we were flying on passes, standby passes, and um, we didn't get on the flight. And so at the middle of the night, um, we were trying to, we, we, were, we had to wait till the same not time the next day to try to get on the flight. And so we were trying to find a hotel. And anyway, we, long story, I won't go into all the detail of it, but we were essentially kidnapped uh, and taken where who knows what they were trying to do uh, to us. Uh, they, you know, a bunch of people came out and it was a, basically a nightmare. Um, but we had prayer groups meeting every night. And that particular night, Randy and Howard, uh, they, I think it was the only two of them were praying for us. And they were prompted to pray from Deuteronomy 28, uh, Deuteronomy 28, the enemy shall come against you one way, but he shall flee seven ways. And that's exactly what happened. He came against us, but just supernaturally, he fled. Uh, and see, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about that we need. You know. And God is, God is our healer, too. I, you know, I was trying to just think for myself what, how God has healed me. I mean, he's healed me a lot, several times apart from medical treatment. He is, a, he is still our healer. You know, sometimes, I mean, he's healed. My blood pressure is now normal, which it was high, but that's through taking blood pressure medicine. Um, but I know at least three different situations I can remember. I remember one time my, I had had lower back problems and they were bothering me and I had been, been praying about them and, and, and thanking the Lord that he is my healer in all of these things. And just, I, was, I remember sitting uh, in my sofa in the den. This was where we lived on uh, Alpha Ebenezer. And I could just feel just like a, push and wait a minute my back didn't hurt anymore it was just God just 
correcting me, giving me a chiropractic treatment. <laughs> and then I remember also uh, my sciatic nerve was killing me. I mean, I remember trying to just to take the dog on a walk or just even to take him or her to the bathroom. And, you know, I could hardly, hardly walk. And then one time when Terry Bennett was here, I forgot which year it was, he had a word of knowledge that God was healing sciatic nerves. And so he prayed for that. And, you know, he stand up if you want prayer for that, I think. And so I stood up and, you know, nothing happened. Within about two or three days later, I began to realize, wait a minute, my sciatic nerve is not hurting anymore. Um, and so, and you know, I'm not saying I've never had a tinge of pain there before, since then, but I have some. But essentially, that degree of pain uh, was, was gone. And so God is, uh, well, one more. I'll tell one more story. I, I, my shoulder was like, I thought I had a separated shoulder or something, or some sort of a separated or a torn rotator cuff or something like that. And, you know, nothing was happening. And, and Dot, and hopefully I hope Dot will be able to come back. Dot says, well, you know, you know how she does. I'm just going to pray for you. <laughs> And, you know, a month later, you know, I couldn't lift my arm. And a month later, you know, everything was fine. Um, so God is our healer and God is our provider and God is our protector. Uh, he is those things. And we need to learn to call upon him. I think we need a fresh stirring of calling upon God uh, in this way. Uh, now, I, I want to just uh, talk just for a few minutes about how do we do that? How do we do that? Um, you know, God's covenant promise is the anchor to our soul. But it says in Galatians, he's redeemed us. Let me, let me uh, actually read that. Galatians 3.13 Galatians 3.13 it's actually 314. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promise of the Spirit through faith. So it's not just, you know, some approaches are just like, if I confess it enough uh, that, you know, I'll manip basically manipulate God into healing me. Uh, it's not that. Uh, I remember when we first started the church, there were just a few of us that were here back then, but we had, we had like three groups. It was basically a nightmare for me. We had, we had a word faith group. We had an evangelical uh, Baptist type group. And then we had a third group that was, had been like an evangelical, but we, we knew there was more and we wanted whatever God wanted. And it was like, okay, if I preached anything other than absolute healing, the word faith group, you know, came to me and said, oh, no, you know, this is not good. You know, I mean, I remember back then, one of the reasons we, we were like a con we were congregational government back then, and, you know, I was trying to get approval from the congregation to get some money towards health insurance. Oh, you don't need health insurance. You live by faith. <laughs> yeah. and, and so anyway, it was a nightmare. But the Lord used it. It was actually, looking back on it, it was one of the best times, really, because God forced me, used that to force me deep in to figure out what I believe uh, there. But I'm, one of the point I was going to make, I'm not talking about that type of thing. What I'm talking about is when a, you know, to, to begin to put the fact that God is those things into our belief system. Meditate on these things. You know, it was interesting 
uh, Drew sent Brian and I a text yesterday. He said, you know, the Lord's really put Psalm 1 on my heart as a key. Uh, of course, he had no idea what I was, well, maybe he had some idea, but I, he, because uh, he was here last week, but um, he didn't know what I was going to be talking about, I don't think. He said he felt like Psalm 1, meditate upon my word day and night, and you'll be like a tree planted by the waters. And that, that's what we got. We, we need to incorporate meditation on the scriptures, but the fact that God is our healer, God is our provider, God is our protector, so that when there's a time of need, he can be the anchor uh, in that area. But then the, 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 this is the way I believe it works, by the Spirit. You know, we're heirs to the blessing of Abraham, and he has given us that promise of the Holy Spirit. So we can't just kind of ritualistically confess that he is Jehovah Rapha, and if I confess it enough times with enough faith that God's going uh, to heal me. No, it's not that. We, we walk by the Spirit of God. We walk by the Spirit of God, and as we do that with this framework that God has given us heirs to the blessings of Abraham and has redeemed us from the curse of sickness and uh, poverty and all of these things, that are, if we believe that and we walk in the, in, in believing that, when we have a need, we, he's the anchor. The, 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 and the covenant is the anchor. And so what we do is we, how does he work miracles among us? By hearing with faith, hearing with faith. And so we say, okay, Lord, what are you doing here? What do you want to do here? I believe you. I believe that you are, this is part of the, my faith structure, that, you are, that I'm heirs to this thing. What do you want to do in this situation? I ask you for it. I believe for it. And what are you going to do? When we got hit with all the, the COVID stuff this past December, um, you know, there was all the people here and they got hit with it. And then it was at Stephen's wedding and uh, a, a number of Catherine's family got hit with it. And some of those were in very precarious situations because of prior health issues and everything. Not that they were that bad in the in terms of the cases. Uh, so I said, okay, Lord, you know, we, we started praying for healing and the, and the Lord gave me this verse that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he'll deliver us from them all. And I, so I began to pray that. Don and I began to pray that. And we prayed it for ourselves, obviously, because we were hit with it, but we prayed it for everybody that, uh, that had it, that we knew about. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but you'll deliver them out of them all. Hearing, hearing with faith. And we believe that word. And so, you know, it's more to it than just a ritualistic confession. It's walking with the Lord and doing what he said do. I'll give you one other uh, example of the opposite. This was years and years ago, but it was, this was one of the word faith people back in uh, the days. But there was a, a, a lady that was uh, the mother of another couple that came, and she had a, a bad case of, I think it was emphysema. Uh, and... She came and she had a, uh, an oxygen tank uh, every week when she came. A very faithful and loving lady. And so anyway, there was, we had prayed. Actually, I think it was, it's been a while, but I think we prayed for it at one of our services. And she was healed. And she, uh, you know, she started coming to church and didn't bring the oxygen tank. And she was healed from her breathing. And then just a few weeks later, she went into the hospital, and what I thought it was was a, a situation where, uh, you know, she had testified of God's healing power, and the enemy was trying to steal her healing. And so we were getting ready to go to war against that and began to do that, and I went to the hospital to see her uh, and was getting ready to pray that way, and the Lord said, no, don't pray that way. I'm taking her home. And so I just, and I was wondering, so... I kind of prayed this, you know, Lord, let your will be done kind of prayer. Um, and she died right after that. Um, and I asked the Lord afterwards, I said, why did, 
you know, you, why, why did this work out this way? And he said, you know, her heart was to be healed. And she didn't die of emphysema. It didn't come back on her. She died of something else. But I wanted, her, I wanted to answer that prayer for her before I took her home. But it was, I was taking her home. And so we don't ever know, but that's why we have to live, live by the Spirit. We have to walk by the Spirit. But, but we need this framework of covenant to say this fits in to the framework. And it fits into what Jesus did. Jesus cleansed, like we talked last week, he cleansed and went to the temple, but he also healed the lame and the blind. He also said in Luke chapter 4, I have come to give sight to the blind. I have come to, to raise up the downtrodden. I have come to do this. He's come into our heart to do these things uh, as well. So this is my challenge as we close is to say, is to believe that God is our healer, to believe that he is our provider, to believe that he is our protector, and all the other things that are in there. But essentially those three are the real ones that I feel like it was, it's absolutely essential that we need to come uh, to believe him for those things. And to meditate upon that and to confess that, that to him in our prayer time. Lord, I thank you that you are my healer, that you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer, and that you said you'll put none of these diseases upon me. When we're, when we're well, thank him for those things. You know, Psalm 103 talks about that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, and I'll forget none of his benefits, for he has healed all my diseases. He has pardoned my iniquities. He has redeemed my life. From the pit, he satisfied my years with good things. He's renewed my youth like the eagle. Believe him for those things. And then when something comes up into our life, Lord, what are you saying here? Uh, I know that you are my healer. What do you want me to pray? How do you want me to pray? How do you want me to listen? Listen by the Spirit and then be obedient to that. It's a new way of living. It's a, It's... Maybe it's better to say it's a fresh stirring for most of us in this area. And I want to challenge us all to believe that God is and will and can do all these things. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to close by just declaring over us uh, from Deuteronomy 28, these first 14 or so verses of Scripture. So let's just stand up for a minute and then I'll, after that I'll turn it back over to Brian. Father, we just make a declaration over all of us that Lord, you will set us far above all the nations of the earth. We declare that blessings shall come upon us and overtake us as we obey the Lord our God. We thank you that we shall be blessed in the city and we shall be blessed in the country. We thank you that we shall be, that our offspring shall be blessed and the produce of our ground, in other words, our, what we put our hand to to work shall be blessed. The offspring of our beasts, the increase of the herd and the young of our flock, the work that we do shall be blessed. We thank you that our basket and our kneading bowls shall be full. We thank you that you shall bless, we shall be blessed when we come in and when we go out. We thank you that, Lord, the, the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They shall come out one way and shall flee before you seven ways. We thank you that the Lord will, you will command the blessing upon our barns and in all that we put our hand to and he will bless us in the land which the Lord our God gives us. We thank you that the Lord will establish us as a holy people to himself as he swore to us if we will keep the commandments of our Lord our God and walk in his ways. 
We thank you that the, the people of the earth shall see us and call us by the name of the Lord, and they shall, be, they shall reverence or fear us. And the Lord will make, a, make us abound in prosperity in the offspring of your body and the offspring of your beast and in the produce of your ground and the land which the Lord swore to our fathers to give to you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens to give rain to your land in the season and bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord shall make your, you the head and not the tail. And you only shall be above and you shall not be underneath if you will listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you today to observe them carefully. And do not turn aside from any of them, which I command you today to the right or to the left to go after the other gods to serve them. We thank you, Father, for the declaration and the promises and the blessings of God. Amen. 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 I want to just say one more thing real quick. I know this is the timing of the Lord. Remember last week I, I talked about that uh, on the way we, we had us all these birds that we scattered with the car came, you know, and in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham had to scatter, had to shoo away the birds of prey off the covenant sacrifice. That was, I said, that's the first time that's ever happened on the way. On the way today, the second time it ever happened. This was kind of right next to Tim and Roxy's house, right? And there's like, there was a, on the side of the road kind of where the pipeline is, more birds than then last week. There were more birds there. And as we drove uh, the car down, these birds scattered again. It was confirmation to me that this is what we're, we're living in this time where we're going to have to learn to shoo away these birds of prey uh, by living by the, the covenant promises of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, amen. Brian, go ahead. <laughs>